All right, we come to the second part of the video on the novel Frankenstein. The creature is now talking to its creator for the first time. The creature is now talking to Victor Frankenstein. This is after the death of William and Justine. He is telling the creator or Victor how after Victor left him, he met some humans and started learning to talk and read etc. Night quickly shut in. But to my extreme wonder, I found that the cottagers had a means of prolonging light by the use of tapers or candles and was delighted to find that the setting of the sun did not put an end to the pleasure I experienced in watching my human neighbours. His neighbours were a family and he had a lot of joy watching them in the evening, the young girl and her companion were employed in various occupations, which I did not understand. And the old man again took up the instrument which produced the divine sounds. That is the uh, guitar. And that had enchanted me in the morning. He is producing music. So soon as he had finished, the youth began not to play, but to utter sounds that were monotonous and neither resembling the harmony of the old man's instrument nor the songs of the birds. That means they began to speak. I since found that he read aloud, his reading, sorry, not speaking, reading. I since found that he read aloud, but at that time I knew nothing of the signs of words or letters. This is the noble savage he is encountering human civilization for the first time. The creature continues its story. The creature had learned about life and society in a Lockean empiricist manner. John Locke believed that empiricism is what uh, defines us. That means experience is the source of knowledge. In the case of the monster, there is nothing that he had when he was born. Everything he got from experience only. So, near the family's house, that is the de Lacy family, near their house, there was a shed or a hovel. From a hovel, he watched the de Lacy family. There was the blind peasant de Lacy, his son Felix, daughter Agatha, and Felix's sweetheart, Safi, who would join them later. One day, the next day what he did is he brought firewood and kept it outside their door. And when they opened the door, they found firewood there. Felix didn't have to go to bring firewood. Like this, they, he, see, he secretly, the monster, secretly helped them and also learned by spying on them. He learned from them. This shows that the creatures, sorry, the creatures true nature is helpful. This is, as I told you earlier, a Godwinian idea. William Godwin believed that man is naturally good and he is corrupted by the conditions he lives in. The creature is also like that. The de Lazies were wealthy in France and like our monster, they also have suffered injustice. It is an unjust society, you see. Mary Shelley is presenting her husband's view. When Felix, what happened was earlier before the, this uh, moment was, Felix had helped a Turkish man, that is Safi's father. Safi's father is Turkish, Safi, Safi is Turkish and Felix and Safi's Turkish father had revolted against the unjust judicial system for which they were punished. Like Percy Shelley was also punished for voicing his protest against injustice. Now, Felix is in love with Safi, this man's daughter. And she has now come to live with them. Safi has also come to live with them. While uh, he spies on these people, he learns language from them. He learns speaking, of course. And he even 
teaches himself to read and write. The monster starts reading and writing. Once, it is not realistic, don't take it realistically. Once in the woods, he comes upon a jacket with a notebook and letters. All this belonged to Victor himself once. This were lost by Victor. From the notes, the monster learns of his creation. So this is about self-learning. This is about the romantic view of education. You have to learn by yourself. You have to learn from experience. And Victor had endured a rejection by mankind. Now he has come to know about how he was created. And he wants to take revenge on his creator's family for having brought this trauma upon him. The monster, from the jacket, he gets books. And he reads Paradise Lost, Plutarch's Lives and Goethe's Sorrows of Young Werther. All these are novels that are in some way or the other related to the monster's situation, especially Paradise Lost. He is attracted by Paradise Lost. Let us hear what he has to say. But Paradise Lost excited different and far deeper emotions. I read it as I had read the other volumes which had fallen into my hands as a true history. He thought this really happened. He did not know. It is imagination. It moved every feeling of wonder and awe that the picture of an omnipotent God warring with his creatures was capable of exciting. Because here also it is like a victor warring with his creation. I often referred the several situations as their similarity struck me to my own. Like Adam, he is comparing himself to Adam. Like Adam, I was apparently united by no link to any other being in existence. But his state was far different from mine in every other aspect. Our creature's situation is far worse. He had come forth from the hands of God, a perfect creature, happy and prosperous, guided by the special care of his creator, which is quite unlike our monster's situation. He was allowed to converse with and acquire knowledge from beings of a superior nature. But I was wretched, helpless and alone. Many times I considered Satan as the fitter emblem of my condition. The monster, monster is also like Satan, for often like him. When I viewed the bliss of my protectors, the bitter gall of envy rose within me. Like Satan, he wants to destroy the family of Victor. When the others have gone out, the monster talks to the blind peasant, De Lazy. He cannot see the hideous monster, so he is kind to the monster. Then Felix and the others come and beat the creature out of the house. Again, he meets with rejection. Now let us hear from the book. At that instant, the cottage door was opened and Felix, Safi and Agatha entered. Who can describe their horror and consternation on beholding me? Agatha fainted and Safi, unable to attend to her friend, rushed out of the cottage. Felix darted forward and with supernatural force tore me from his father, to whose knees I clung like a child, you know. In a transport of fury, he dashed me to the ground and struck me violently with a stick. The monster is not doing anything back. He has superhuman strength. But he's like a child, whimpering and longing for love and care. You should understand that he's suffering the monster. I could have torn him limb from limb as the lion rends the antelope. But my heart sank within me as with bitter sickness and I refrained. I saw him on the point of repeating his blow. When overcome by pain and anguish, I quitted the cottage 
and in the general tumult escaped unperceived to my hovel. He's like a child in pain. He's suffering. If you beat a child like this, he will also turn into a monster. The creature is cast out of that house and meets with rejection. The trauma of his mind is further explained by the author. As the night advanced, a fierce wind arose from the woods and quickly dispersed the clouds that had loitered in the heavens. A blast tore along like a mighty avalanche. Blast means wind. Like a mighty storm or avalanche or landslide, the wind tore and produced a kind of insanity in my spirits. I was wild with anger and grief and loss and pain. It produced a kind of insanity in my spirits that burst all bounds of reason and reflection. Out of grief and frustration, he's throwing a tantrum. I lighted the dry branch of a tree and danced with fury around the devoted cottage with, his, with the fire in his arms like Prometheus, my eyes still fixed on the western horizon, the edge of which the moon nearly touched. He's going mad with sadness, loneliness, desperation. The creature now begs Victor to create a mate for him. A monster, equally grotesque, so that she would not hate him and she would be his sole companion. Again, like Adam and Eve. They would go and live somewhere in the new world in South America. And for a moment, Victor is moved to compassion and agrees. What is horrendous here is not the monster. It is the act of Victor. That is the monstrosity. After returning to Geneva, Victor and Claire will go to England and Victor's purpose is to create a female monster. Leaving Clerval in Scotland, Victor lives in a desolate island in the Orkneys and works reluctantly. He wants to help the monster and create the female, but he doesn't want to do it either. One night, Victor glances out of the window to see the creature glaring in at him with a ghastly grin. This creature has been following him everywhere. He wants to see the progress of the work. Horrified by the possible consequences of his work, Victor destroys his new creation. Victor cannot make the female. The monster enraged vows revenge, swearing that he will be with Victor on Vic Victor's wedding night. That's a horrendous moment. Let us read from the text about the moral anguish of Victor. This is a pivotal moment in the text, a climactic moment in the text. I sat one evening in my laboratory. The sun had set and the moon was just <coughs> and the moon was just rising from the sea. I had not sufficient light for my employment. And I remained idle. In a pause of consideration of whether I should leave my labor for the night or hasten its conclusion by an unremitting attention to it. Victor is sitting there making the female and wondering whether he should proceed or wait. As I sat, a train of reflection occurred to me which led me to consider the effects of what I was now doing. Three years before, I was engaged in the same manner and I had created a fiend whose unparalleled barbarity had desolated my heart and filled it forever with the bitterest remorse. I was now about to form another being 
of whose dispositions I was alike ignorant. She might become ten thousand times more malignant than her mate and delight for its own sake in murder and wretchedness. He had sworn to quit the neighborhood of man and hide himself in deserts, but she had not. And she, who in all probability was to become a thinking and reasoning animal, might refuse to comply with a compact made before her creation. They might even hate each other. The creature who already lived loathed his own deformity and might he not conceive a greater abhorrence for it when it came before his eyes in the female form? She also might turn with disgust from him to the superior beauty of man. She might quit him and he be again alone thus exasperated by the fresh provocation of being deserted by one of his own species. Even if they were to leave Europe and inhabit the deserts of the new world, yet one of the first results of those sympathies for which the demon thirsted would be children. And a race of devils would be propagated upon the earth who might make the very existence of the species of man a condition precarious and full of terror. Had I right for my own benefit to inflict this curse upon everlasting generations? I had before been moved by the sophisms of the being I had created. I had been struck senseless by his fiendish threats. But now, for the first time, like this he goes on. This is a speech of moral anguish. And the creature's anguish is now seen. The creature is also in anguish. Shall each man, cried he, find a wife for his bosom? And each beast have his mate, and I be alone? Everybody can have a mate except me. I had feelings of affection and they were requited by detestation and scorn. Man, you may hate, but beware. He's telling his creator, man, you may hate me, but beware. Your hours will pass in dread and misery and soon the bolt will fall, which must ravish from you your happiness forever. The creature is so angry that he has destroyed the female. Are you to be happy while I grow well in the intensity of my wretchedness? You can blast my other passions. Every other passion you can blast, but revenge remains. Revenge, henceforth, dearer than light or food. I may die, but first you, my tyrant and tormentor, shall curse the sun that gazes on your misery. Beware, for I am fearless and therefore powerful. I will watch with the wiliness of a snake, again biblical, that I may sting with its venom. Man, you shall repent of the injuries you inflict. And then Victor replies, Devil, cease. And do not poison the air with these sounds of malice. I have declared my resolution to you. I cannot make you a female. And I am no coward to bend beneath words. Leave me. I am inexorable. That is when the fiend or the demon speaks that dreadful sentence. It is well, I go. But remember, I shall be with you on your wedding night. Oh my God. From that moment... Victor's terror increases. He cannot forget this sentence. I shall be with you on your wedding night. Victor thinks this is a death threat, that he will die. Indeed, the creature takes revenge. Henry Clerval's body is washed ashore with finger marks on the neck, like before. 
and Victor is beyond himself with grief. He cannot suffer the death of his dear friends because of his own folly. Look at how he sees the dead body of his friend. I entered the room where the corpse lay and was led up to the coffin. How can I describe my sensations on beholding it? I feel yet parched with horror. Nor can I reflect on that terrible moment without shuddering and agony. The examination. The presence of the magistrate, the witnesses passed like a dream from my memory. When I saw the lifeless form of Henry Clerval stretched before me, I gasped for breath and throwing myself on the body, I exclaimed, Have my murderous machinations deprived you also, my dearest Henry, of life? Two I have already destroyed. Other victims await their destiny, but you, Clerval, my friend, my benefactor. Victor is so grief-stricken that he becomes very ill and nearly dies. And Victor is suspected of the crime but is acquitted by Mr. Kirwin, the magistrate. Then, once he is out of danger, Victor, who is only the shadow of a man, travels with his father Alphonse in France briefly before they returned home. During this travel, during this journey, throughout, he is tormented by guilt. And he gets a frightful dream on a ship. The past appeared to me in the light of a frightful dream. Yet the vessel in which I was, the wind that blew me from the detested shore of Ireland, and the sea which surrounded me told me too forcibly that I was deceived by no vision. And that Clerval, my friend and my dearest companion, had fallen a victim to me and the monster of my creation. I repassed in my memory, my whole life, the quiet happiness while residing with my family in Geneva, the death of my mother, the departure for Ingolstadt. I remembered shuddering the mad enthusiasm that hurried me on to the creation of my hideous enemy. And I called to mind the night in which he first lived. I was unable to pursue the train of thought. A thousand feelings pressed upon me and I wept bitterly. Ever since my recovery from the fever, I had been in the custom of taking every night a small quantity of laudanum, which is an elixir of opium. For it was by means of this drug alone that I was enabled to gain the rest necessary for the preservation of life. Otherwise, I couldn't sleep. Oppressed by the recollection of my various misfortunes, I now swallowed double my usual quantity and soon slept profoundly. But sleep did not afford me respite from thought and misery. My dreams presented a thousand objects that scared me. Towards morning, I was possessed by a kind of nightmare. I felt the fiend's grasp in my neck because he is fearing that on his wedding night he will die and could not free myself from it. Groans and cries rang in my ears. This is a terrible moment that is described. And the terror only increases. Back home in Geneva, Victor is terrified, especially of the night, and cannot be happy with Elizabeth. She had already sent him a letter asking him 
if he loved another because he was different and she couldn't understand what he was scared of but victor cannot forget the threat i will be with you on your wedding night he fears for his own life upon his father's instructions victor even though he doesn't want it prepares for the wedding day and he is increasingly scared of the monster lurking in the shadows he carries pistols and a dagger surreptitiously on the day of the wedding after the wedding they go to evian to spend the night there is an inn there inside the inn they are briefly separated when victor goes round looking at the rooms and then he hears a dreadful scream there is then a heartrending description of victor's state of mind upon seeing his beloved murdered elizabeth has been killed when i recovered i found myself surrounded by the people of the inn their countenances expressed a breathless terror but the horror of others appeared only as a mockery a shadow of the feelings that oppressed me i escaped from them to the room where lay the body of elizabeth my love my wife so lately living so dear so worthy she had been moved from the posture in which i had first beheld her and now as she lay her head upon her arm and a handkerchief thrown across her neck and face i might have supposed her asleep i rushed towards her and embraced her with ardor but the deadly languor and coldness of the limbs told me that what i now held in my arms had ceased to be elizabeth whom i had loved and cherished the murderous mask of the fiend's grasp was on her neck and the breath had ceased to issue from her lips while i still hung over her in the agony of despair i happened to look up the windows of the room had before been darkened i felt a kind of panic on seeing the pale yellow light of the moon illuminate the chamber the shutters had been thrown back and with a sensation of horror not to be described i saw at the open window a figure the most hideous and abhorred a grin was on the face of the monster he seemed to jeer as with his fiendish finger he pointed towards the corpse of my wife i rushed towards the window and drawing a pistol from my bosom fired but he eluded me leaped from his station and running with the swiftness of lightning plunged into the lake alphonse is overcome with grief at elizabeth's death and soon he also dies victor confesses to a local magistrate about the monster the local authorities are confused about what their action should be at that time victor decides that the time has come he sets off in search of the monster to exact revenge he has to destroy his own creation he travels follows the monster from geneva to switzerland italy mediterranean sea black sea russia and finally the desolate arctic the monster steals a dog sled team victor pursues him and comes very close to the monster but the eyes on which they were traveling begins to crack and the ice cracking ice separates the two there ends victor's story because at this time robert walton found him with the dying dogs now the final letters that walton is writing in august september 
Victor produced the letters, letters of Felix and Safi and proved his story true. He tells Walton to learn from Victor's mistakes that knowledge for evil ends that knowledge for evil ends leads to disaster. He wants Walton to carry on with his mission to destroy the monster. At this time, Victor is dying and the crew are on the point of a mutiny because they want to return. They don't want to remain in this frozen wilderness and die. Meanwhile, Victor dies and the creature breaks into the ship's cabin. Both Victor and the creature are shocked. Then the creature tells his side of the story. Convinced that he will not get human sympathy, he resolved to remain in the frozen North Pole. The creature is not evil. He swears not to harm Walton and his crew. Now that the only living thing that connected the creature to this world is gone, that is his creator Victor is gone, the creature hopes for his own death. I shall ascend my funeral pile triumphantly and exult in the agony of the torturing flames. He wants to die. The monster leaves, sorry, leaps overboard from the ship and disappears into the wilderness. Thus ends the story of Frankenstein. Frankenstein is replete with romantic themes. Knowledge is symbolized by light in this novel as against the dark natural world. The ruthless pursuit of knowledge denoted by fire, which both Walton and Frankenstein engage in, is dangerous and self-destructive. The ruthless pursuit of knowledge is denoted by fire. It is self-destructive and dangerous. The novel offers a powerful treatment of the sublime natural world as a source of unrestrained emotional experience. The sublime natural world is like a character, always there, tempestuous, and it is a source of unrestrained emotional experience. The theme of monstrosity pervades the novel. The theme of monstrosity. The hideous monster is a social outcast. Mary Shelley seems to show that monsters are not born, they are made. And more hideous than the monster, more monstrous than the monster are the people. Victor Frankenstein himself is a monster inside, whose ambition and selfishness alienate him from the society. Critics have described the novel itself as a monster. Like Frankenstein's creation, the novel is a stitched together combination of different voices and texts. Within the framework of Walton's letters, we have Victor's story fitting in, inside which is the monster story. And inside the monster story, there is the love story of the peasant Felix and the Turkish woman Safi. All this is linked to the theme of alienation or isolation as well as justice. Alienation is of, the, of Victor as well as Walton due to their learning and ambition. Victor and Walton are alone because of their learning and ambition. And they have to bear the consequences of their action alone. It is because of alienation or loneliness that Victor is creating the monster and Walton is writing letters to his sister, Mrs. Saville. Alienation is a feature of the Arctic where the novel is partly set and that creates a Gothic setting. Remember, the Arctic is a Gothic setting of the ancient mariner of Coleridge as well. Alienation of the creature. Like Victor is alienated from the society because of his horrendous act, the creature is alienated due to its hideous appearance as well as his 
murders and that is what victor thinks but actually the creature is alienated due to the unfairness of victor and the society human nature or human life by definition is loneliness human life is precarious any time you may die and your suffering in your suffering also you are alone nobody can follow you to death and suffering the theme of ambition is there right from the title of the novel the modern prometheus the character frankenstein is like faustus by creating this monster he is selling the soul to the devil he is also like prometheus he is like adam and eve ambition is natural it is human but it should be coupled with responsibility you cannot just do anything and get away with it victor the problem is that victor shirks his responsibility and keeps his guilt to himself he doesn't share with anyone walton however is different he does not ignore his fellow men and finally sails home he is not as selfish as victor victor's ambition is analogous to the unbridled ego the ego wants to do many things the ego thinks that whatever it knows is the truth however on victor the irrational impulses of the id also work victor is impulsive irrational without thinking he created this monster that is an expression of the id remember at the time mary shelley wrote this novel there is no understanding of the ego id or super ego we are applying from a later period the monster represents the super ego or conscience and creates guilt in victor now the theme of responsibility the whole novel depicts the consequences of irresponsibility victor creates a monster irresponsibly does not create sorry does not care for his creation and victor is responsible for the sufferings and death of his loved ones also the whole novel shows that science should be used responsibly the novel shows the limits of responsibility and the importance of parental responsibility and nurture victor is like a parent to the monster and it shows the dangers of science now the theme of birth or creation the whole story is a parody of the biblical myth of creation as well as fall of man here you should understand the role of a woman in creating life the problem with victor's creation is that woman was not involved so it is unnatural he is creating without a woman and trying to be like god this is a criticism of scientists modern science attempting to create life a critique of man's violation of nature in this novel there is also an unmistakable fear of sexuality depicted victor is appalled by his act of creation like probably mary shelley was appalled by sexuality and pregnancy that led to the death of her children the dream where he kisses elizabeth and she turns into the corpse of his mother is also a direct depiction of the fear of sexuality his horror at his father's suggestion that he should marry elizabeth also shows the same abhorrence of sexuality The novel is replete with intertextual connections. There are numerous references to the Bible, Paradise Lost, Tintin Abbey, and a profusion of other texts. The subtitle of the novel underscores the intertextual nature of the novel. This is not only the story of Frankenstein; it is intertextually connected with the story of Prometheus. The Greek Titan god Prometheus gave the knowledge of fire to humanity. and is severely punished for it like that 
Victor gave the knowledge of creation to humanity for which he is punished. The knowledge remains a secret and ends with him. Now, the connections with Paradise Lost. The epigraph to Frankenstein is from Milton's epic. Did I request thee, maker, from my clay to mould me man? Did I solicit thee from darkness to promote me? This question is raised by the monster to our victor as well. There are parallels between the characters. God, Victor is like God because he is trying to create. Like God, he neglected his creation. In the Bible and in Paradise Lost, this is there. God neglected his creation. Satan. Victor is also like Satan. Frankenstein's monster was created benevolent and the creation defied his master. Like Satan defied God. Victor created life against natural order and the creation was in complete solitude. So he is like Adam also. Now references to Tintin Abbey. Shelley makes this reference to Wordsworth's poem after the monster meets Victor and tells him his story. In Tintin Abbey, the speaker has three selves representing the past, present and the future. When the speaker is younger, the speaker finds great pleasure and joy in being with nature. But he no longer has those, has that same boyish love later. He loses that love and enters into a second self. In the second stage, he is more like a man fleeing from something that he dreads. Like one who sought the thing he loved. Than one who sought the thing he loved. In the second stage, he is almost like escaping. The two people in Tintin Abbey are significant in Frankenstein. The two persona or the two stages in Tintin Abbey are significant in Frankenstein because they parallel Victor and Clerval. Several lines from Tintin Abbey are quoted to illustrate the fall of both Victor and the monster. To reinforce the romantic themes of the novel, especially that nature ultimately wins. Now, some interpretations of Frankenstein. There have been feminist interpretations since the 1960s. The text, Testella, the novel is a devastating critique. The novel Frankenstein is a devastating critique of patriarchal institutions that crushed the opportunities of women. Women had no opportunity in the Victorian society. They were crushed by the patriarchal society. Just as Justin Moritz is crushed, Elizabeth is crushed. The novel is full of male traits. Why Elizabeth is neglected is because her husband did not confide in her. He did not give her love. He was tormented by his own guilt and selfishness. The novel is full of so-called male traits such as selfishness and lack of imagination. I am not saying they are male traits. Traditionally, they are accepted as male traits. And women or mothers would rather sacrifice. Frankenstein kept Elizabeth in the dark about his work. He never told her what he is doing. Elizabeth has a natural affinity for beauty. If he had confided in her, she would have guided him towards something better. But he cannot confide in her. After all, she is a woman. The novel can also be subjected to Marxist interpretation. The novel can be regarded as a parable of capitalism. Frankenstein represents the privileged elite treating the creature or the working class with contempt and hatred. The contempt of Frankenstein for the creature is like the contempt of the rich elite people for the working classes.
the creature like the rebellious working class won't tolerate his neglect and hatred so the rebellion of the creature is like class struggle and then frankenstein as a gothic novel frankenstein is a prototype of scientific fiction it is not completely a gothic novel alone it is a an unconventional gothic novel it is more like science fiction later the gothic elements are many i will just list out a few the attic where the monster is created the creature's villainous pursuit of victor and his family depictions of dead bodies and murder frankenstein's response to his filthy creation hysterical emotional responses all these are gothic elements there are many more gothic elements also however this is not a typical gothic novel because it departs from the cliched gothic theme of an afflicted heroine confined to a haunted castle it gives more in depth psychological analysis especially through the letter method and the first person narration this is more like psychological novel than gothic novel now you should understand that there are two types of the gothic according to robert de hume there is radcliffe's novel of terror and gregory monk lewis's novel of horror many other men also practiced novel of horror the gothic is a genre that rejects the rationalism and order of a masculine its colonial world neo classical literature or augustan literature was masculine its colonial the gothic on the other hand shows the aesthetics of irrationality and hysteric passions hence the gothic genre offers scope for resistance against the patriarchal or colonial order the gothic genre presents a parallel universe occupied by those unheard and unwritten the genre therefore has been employed by many women writers as well as post colonial writers there is a term called female gothic the gothic as i told you has a predominant female presence written by women readers are women and they often center a cent- feature a central heroine ellen mowers it was in literary women who coined the term female gothic that was in 1977 female gothic refers to the unique treatment of the gothic genre by women writers and how it implicates their gender the term laid a foundation for a new way of thinking about women and the gothic genre now how ellen mowers coined this term is a long story in a 1969 article titled gothic versus romantic a revaluation of the gothic novel robert hume had distinguished between the novel of terror and the novel of horror Robert D Hume in 1969 distinguished between Anne Radcliffe's novel of terror and Gregory Monk Lewis's novel of horror Hume however focused his piece on the male dominated horror gothic he liked Gregory Monk Lewis's horror gothic dismissed Radcliffe and her uh, many emulators as not serious this led to a controversy a flood of critical attention to both the gothic genre and the female authors ellen mowers replied to robert robert hume she analyzed the radcliffean heroine traditionally the gothic heroine is young attractive virginal and endlessly helpless running away from a psychotic man or a demon however radcliffean heroines are quite contradictory in their actions and implications they are not like the traditional gothic heroines instead of conforming to the style of male gothic writers radcliffe invented a fictional language and a set of conventions within which respectable feminine sexuality finds expression she praises radcliffe's heroine that laid the foundations of the term female gothic 
a related term post colonial gothic also emerged there has been an abundant critical output in the 21st century regarding the interrelationship between the post colonial and the gothic fields in gothic fiction there is an increasing presence of the colonial ideology the post colonial gothic reimagines and recreates ways of being seeing and expressing so as to give voice to those who have largely been unheard of and even discredited the post colonial gothic responds to post colonial situations through the gothic genre there are numerous examples jean rice's white sargasso sea vs nepal's gorillas in white sargasso sea you know it is a prequel to jane eyre and it is a story of antonette cosway who is bertha mason in jane eyre how she becomes mad vs nepal's gorillas published in 1975 is a tale of horrid murder in the caribbean margaret atwood's lady oracle is the story of john foster a romance novelist who fakes her own death tony morrison's beloved is the story of sade an escaped slave she has to kill her daughter a little girl two year old daughter she has had to kill to escape from slavery later on a woman beloved presumed to be the daughter's ghost returns to haunt her home is all this really happening or is it imagined by sate is not clear angela carter's black venus is also important is an anthology of short stories these are all examples for the post colonial gothic gothic romance other influences edmund burke's sublime of terror or sublimity of terror anything that creates terror pain and danger is a source of the sublime another influence was the macabre gothic paintings of john henry fuseli and francisco goya also james macpherson's ossianic poems i will conclude by showing you these paintings John Henry Fuseli's Hamlet and the Ghost of His Father. Fuseli's Titania and Bottom. These are all Gothic paintings. Fuseli's The Nightmare. Francisco Goya was a Spanish artist and called the first modern artist. Towards the end of his career he painted dark dramatic realms of fantasy and nightmare. visions of loneliness fear and social alienation look at courtyard with lunatics or a prison scene francisco goya wrote in the time of the enlightenment when the reformation of prisons was an important goal macpherson's ossianic poems you know are uh, purport to be translations of ancient gaelic poetry there also were paintings attached to these illustrations of the ossianic poems also gothic so that brings us to the end of this massive lecture on frankenstein and the gothic thank you very much the time is 1 o'clock i hope frankenstein will not bang on my window bye